Uh, well, hello and welcome everyone to what is a currently quite dark and blustery Oxford we're coming live from. And uh, for those of you who also uh, joined us uh, last week, you'll be pleased to know I'm back in the office with a stable internet connection. So that's going to really help this evening. So welcome to installment two of our brand new virtual series, Jesus International, where we're looking at work that our academics are doing, which crosses international boundaries and looks broader in terms of, of space. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker for tonight. Uh, Talita's, uh, I'm going to do quite a lot of the talking for the introductions. Talita, unfortunately, is suffering from a cold at the moment. So um, I will do her introduction and then hand, hand over to her. So um, uh, Talita D'Souza Dias is our Shaw Foundation Junior Research Fellow in Law. Uh, her particular interests are in international law and policy surrounding new technologies, including information and communication technologies and artificial intelligence. Her research and policy work has covered a variety of topical issues, ranging from dis and misinformation, online hate speech, propaganda, recommendation algorithms, and harmful cyber operations under different international and domestic legal frameworks. She is a principal investigator of two research projects, Just Speech on the International Law and Policy of Online Hate Speech, and Beat the Algorithm, aiming to design new regulatory and computational models for recommendation algorithms consistent with international human rights law. Before joining Jesus College, she was a postdoctoral research fellow with the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict, a research program based at the Blavatnik School of Government. There, she co-led the Cyber Due Diligence Project, sponsored by the government of Japan. She remains affiliated with ELAC as a research fellow, working mostly on the Oxford process on international law protections in cyberspace, a partnership with Temple University and Microsoft. Since 2020, she has taught law and international law and public policy on the Blavatnik School's Master of Public Policy program. Between 2019 and this, this year, she taught criminal law for law undergraduates at St. Catherine's College, Oxford, where she was also a junior research fellow in 2020 to 2021. In October 2019, she was appointed fellow of the UK Higher Educational Academy. So without further ado, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Talita and tonight's talk. Uh, Talita, over to you. Thank you so much, Peter, for the introduction. So as you can see, uh, my voice is quite hoarse at the moment. Uh, so um, I will try and keep my presentation as short as possible, uh, just so uh, I won't bore you with this terrible voice um, any more than, 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 than I should. But um, as, as Peter said, I am the Shaw Foundation Junior Research Fellow in Law here at Jesus. And my research uh, at Jesus focuses uh, on um, the international legal framework applicable to online hate speech. And so this is why I chose to present to you today uh, one of my papers on this topic, uh, which looks at um, online hate speech uh, and content moderation as a means to tackle online hate speech under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the ICCPR, as you can see on your screen. Um, and uh, I, should, I should have said before that um, it's also a real pleasure to be here today speaking to all of you. And uh, I wish um, I could be in person somewhere with you, but uh, thanks to technology, we can make this happen, even though we are in very different places right now. And this is the beauty and the bright side of the, of the internet. But um, my talk today will focus on one of the ugly, uh, not so bright faces of technology, uh, which is uh, how technology and in particular, social media platforms, other types of online platforms have been used by individuals, groups and nation states to, to spread hate and drive uh, violent behavior as well as other um, uh, harms offline. And, um, my paper also looks at how um, online hate speech can be moderated or, uh, or regulated in line with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So um, I wanted to start with a little bit of background. So basically, what is the problem? Why it matters for us? So what's the motivation behind my research and this paper in particular? So basically, as you, as you may know, um, the, the reason, uh, or one of the reasons that prompted me to, to, to start this, this work and to write this paper in particular 
was a, a series of events that hit the news worldwide over the past few years where online hate led to or spurred offline real world harms in both developed and developing countries. So for example, as we all know, <clears throat> sorry, the January 6th riots um, in the United States Capitol building back in 2020 were in no small part fueled by some inflammatory tweets uh, that were posted by former US president, including uh, this one that you can see on your screen. And uh, in the same vein, uh, in, on the other side of the world, back in 2018, uh, we saw that uh, the already precarious situation of the Rohingya ethnic and religious minority in, my, in Myanmar went out of control and evolved into the killing, the rape, persecution, and other violent acts against hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals, um, which likely amounted to crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. All of that thanks to um, an explosion of hateful posts on Facebook, such as the one that you can see on your screen, calling the Rohingya terrorist dogs and wishing them horrible deaths. So at the same time, um, on the flip side of all this hate online, we've ha we have also seen instances of perfectly legitimate and innocuous types of speech being wrongfully taken down as hate speech or other types of objectionable content by platforms, automated uh, content moderation systems. So for example, back in 2016, this famous um, Pulitzer Prize winning picture uh, that you can see on your screen called Napalm Girl was taken down by Facebook. Even though it was reinstated, it was wrongfully taken down. And uh, also in 2018, an extract of the Declaration of Independence uh, of the United States published by a Texas-based news newspaper, The Vindicator, to celebrate the 4th of July holiday in America was also mistakenly taken down because it contained a historical reference to the merciless Indian savages, as you can see on your screen. So after a lot of protests, Facebook again reinstated uh, the post. So uh, in a nutshell, what we have seen recently uh, on online platforms are these uh, very reactive, binary, out of tune approaches to uh, hate speech and other types of problematic content online. So either online hate and other types of uh, harmful uh, online content have gone unhinged and have led to real world harmful consequences as we saw with the Capitol riots and uh, the, the Rohingya genocide or things that may sound offensive to some but are not really harmful have been taken down wrongfully. And what has been referred to as a big wave of private censorship. Now, this problem of hate speech and the various ways to respond to it uh, is not new. So we know very well how Nazi propaganda and hate for rhetoric contributed to the Holocaust. And we also know how, for example, radio broadcasts in Rwanda back in the 1990s led uh, to the genocide in Rwanda uh, by the Tutsi, uh, sorry, by the Hutus against the Tutsi. And hate speech has been a very politically and culturally divisive topic for decades especially because different people in different countries have different views as to how to balance or to navigate the tensions that exist between freedom of expression, free speech on the one hand, and other uh, protected human rights on the other hand, such as equality uh, or non-discrimination. So uh, what, what is really unprecedented here in the digital age, in the case of online hate, and that has raised unique challenges is the speed, the scale, and the directness with which content can be disseminated online. So all these features of online hate speech and online content more generally, the speed, the scale, and the directness are new. They're unprecedented. They have raised unique challenges for platforms and for governments. And 
And we have also seen uh, the automation of the processes by which content, especially sensationalist and hateful content, is ranked or recommended and amplified online. So this is very new, the way in which algorithms boost the visibility of these kinds of content. And what is also new is the automated ways in which uh, different platforms moderate, take down, or uh, otherwise limit the visibility of these kinds of content. So these are new features that have raised unique challenges um, when it comes to online hate speech and the digital age. And uh, what is also interesting to note is that when people are hiding behind a screen, like I am right now, uh, it is a lot easier to distance oneself from recipients, from different audiences. And it's also very easy to use hateful rhetoric to offend others because you're not really seeing people, you're not close to them. Um, and um, thanks to engagement based and ranking algorithms that uh, these platforms used, uh, these, these different platforms have used, uh, such as Facebook, Google, Twitter, Instagram, sensationalist content has been boosted just an unprecedented extent, right? We have never seen something like this before. So this is the, 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 the new scale and the new nature of the problem that we are facing uh, in the digital age. So it is against this background that my paper and my research more generally has tried to answer three overarching questions that remain underexplored in the literature uh, on this topic to date. So the first question is uh, to what extent there is and there should be an international legal framework to tackle this multifaceted and uh, complex phenomenon of uh, online hate speech. The second and related question is whether there is such a framework, uh, such an international framework, if it can move us away from the leave up, take down binary that is so common on online platforms today. And if we can tackle the problem of online hate speech in a more balanced, more nuanced way. And the third question is how can states, platforms and other relevant stakeholders effectively implement this framework, this international framework to tackle online hate speech through different policies and practice in different parts of the world, including developed in developing countries. Because as we saw earlier, the problem exists not only in developing countries, but also in developed ones. So is there such a framework? Can it move us away from the binary of leaving content up or taking it down? And how can we implement it in practice? So these are the three questions that my paper um, and my research more generally tries to answer. And so in answering these uh, three overarching questions, my paper makes three main uh, claims or arguments. So the first one is that because hate speech, online hate speech is a global phenomenon that crosses national boundaries. It's a trans boundary problem because the internet is not concentrated in one single territory, right? Because of the global nature of the problem, we do need global responses to it. And my argument in the paper is that we already have a basic but workable legal framework that is universal in nature uh, and can be applied to the issue of online hate speech. And this is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, also known as the ICCPR. The second argument that I make in the paper is that actually uh, content moderation or content management more generally is actually a necessary policy to a necessary way to implement the relevant provisions of the ICCPR. The relevant provisions of the ICCPR, as we will see later on in this presentation, are the rights to freedom of expression and information on the one hand, and the prohibition of certain especially egregious forms of hate speech on the other hand. And the third argument that I make in the paper, uh, and this is the most important contribution that my paper makes to the literature, is that while the ICCPR is a bit too general and somewhat outdated to deal with the problem of digital hate, because after all, it was drafted in the 40s and it was adopted in the 60s at a time when the internet didn't exist, let alone social media, right? One can still read into the ICCPR more practical, more granular, and well-calibrated guidance to tackle online hate speech today. 
And in trying to provide this kind of guidance, my paper devises what I call a legal taxonomy of online hate speech or a legal classification of online hate speech, which is grounded in two key features of speech under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And these are the content of speech acts and the legal consequences that different types of speech attract under the ICPR. So let me now unpack these arguments and I hope you are still following despite my terrible, terrible voice. So on the first claim that I make about, about the ICCPR being this appropriate international global framework to tackle online hate speech, I, I argue that um, there are four main reasons why I think the ICCPR is appropriate to deal with the problem of online hate speech. So the first reason is the ICCPR is an international human rights treaty, which is open for ratification by all countries in the world. Right. And it's also a country that, uh, sorry, a treaty that already has 173 states or countries that are parties to it so far, so far, including the United Kingdom, the United States, where most of these online platforms are based in most countries around the world. And because the ICPR is an international treaty with, with so many parties, it contains obligations that are binding that are legally applicable, that are legally binding on all these states to respect and protect the rights to freedom of expression, to information, as well as the right to non-discrimination. And so the ICCPR already contains a number of binding obligations that are relevant in this space. So this is the first reason why it matters in the context of online hate. The second reason that I argue that why the ICCPR is important to tackle the problem of online hate speech is that even though the covenant, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights as a treaty, it is not yet binding on companies such as social media platforms and other big tech companies because under international law, companies are not bound by the rules of international law. I argue that nonetheless, the ICCPR is an important policy mechanism in the corporate world including in the online world. And this is because customers are increasingly, increasingly expecting companies to respect human rights online. And so there is a social expectation and what we call a corporate responsibility for companies to respect and protect human rights voluntarily. Um, while, what I also argue in the paper is that complying with human rights standards also gives companies more legitimacy uh, when it comes to making decisions about what content to leave up or to take down or to otherwise limit online. And I also argue in the paper that it is more cost effective for companies to actually follow a universal standard for content moderation, for dealing with the problem of online hate, rather than trying to work around the patchwork of national laws from different countries where they operate. And in fact, if you look at the current practice of online platforms, most big tech companies like Facebook, Twitter, and Google, I don't know about Twitter, now after Elon Musk has bought it and changed things completely, including by firing a number of human rights lawyers. But in the past, Twitter was one of those big tech companies that actually pledged to ground their platform guidelines and international human rights standards. And uh, in particular, the Facebook oversight board already refers explicitly to the ICPR in its decisions. So international human rights law and the ICPR in particular are already um, dominant, are already part of the dominant narrative of online platforms when it comes to uh, guidelines uh, on hate speech and other types of problematic content. And actually, um, we have seen a number of state regulations and laws, including in the UK with the uh, online safety bill and the EU with the uh, EU Digital Services Act that are to a large extent grounded in international human rights law. And these different laws are going to have a significant impact around the world. This is what we call the Brussels effect when it comes to EU law, but now uh, there's also going to be a UK or London effect with the online safety bill. So the third reason why I argue in the paper that the ICPR is important is that for social, uh, for civil society groups and for individuals, the ICPR is an important advocacy tool 
that they can refer to when making demands to states and to companies with respect to the harmful consequences of online hate speech. So for example, just a few days ago, Amnesty International, one of the most important civil society organizations has published a report concluding that Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram and, and WhatsApp, has a responsibility to provide reparations to Rohingya victims in Myanmar that were affected by online hate on Facebook, one of its platforms. And this finding was grounded explicitly on the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So the fourth and final reason why I think the ICPR is important when it comes to online hate speech, uh, and this is a more general reason, is that it provides all relevant stakeholders in this space, companies, states, individuals, uh, NGOs, uh, civil society organizations. It provides all of these players with a common universal language that has the potential to bridge national and regional divides on the issue of hate speech. And as I mentioned earlier, the issue of hate speech is very divisive, but the ICPR has the potential to bridge those divides with a common universal framework. And, uh, and one of the reasons why the ICPR has this potential is because it protects speech and conflicting rights, such as non-discrimination, in a way that is very flexible and highly contextual and also very deferential to states, giving states a wide margin of appreciation, a wide margin of discretion to follow, to comply with international law, while still giving effect to their own national traditions when it comes to protecting speech. So this is why I think the ICPR has this enormous, this tremendous potential to bridge regional and national divides when it comes to online hate. Uh, and in and, and, and providing this common universal framework to deal with a global problem. Now, um, let me delve a little bit deeper into the relevant provisions that, of, the, of the ICPR that I have alluded to earlier. So there are two key provisions uh, in the ICCPR uh, when it comes to uh, hate speech online and offline. So the first of these provisions is Article 19, which many of you might have heard of, Article 19 and paragraph two grants uh, each and every individual the right to freely seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print, in any form or, or medium. So basically, each and every individual has a right to freedom of expression and to freedom of information in whatever medium that they choose. And so this includes uh, expression and information online, on online platforms. So this is the right to freedom of expression or the right to free speech as they call, as they call it in the United States. But at the same time, Article 19 in paragraph three adds the caveat that the rights to freedom of expression and information carry with them a special duties and responsibilities. And this is precisely because the unrestrained enjoyment of those rights might interfere with the rights of others or with important public goals. So if somebody is allowed to say whatever they want, that might actually, for example, have a chilling effect on the rights of others, the rights of other individuals, especially minorities, to express themselves freely. So if we allow hate speech to go unhinged, people might be afraid to express themselves in an online or offline space, right? And if, for example, we allow people to say whatever they want, including lies and you know things like health misinformation or disinformation, that might affect, for example, uh, the protection of health, public health and society, right? Or the rights of other individuals to proper or truthful information. So this is why the rights to freedom of expression and information are not absolute they may be subject to limitations, right? Um, however, for states uh, and also platforms to be able to limit the rights to freedom of expression and information, they have to do so in accordance with law. So any limitations on expression and information must be grounded in accessible and foreseeable laws. And these um, limitations, they must also be based on what we call a legitimate purpose, a legitimate public policy purpose. And Article 19.3 lists exhaustively 
uh, the following uh, public, pol public policy uh, grounds for limiting speech. So as you can see on your screen, the rights and reputations of others. So for example, things like defamation uh, may be limited because defamation might infringe upon the rights or reputations of others. Uh, the protection of national security is also one of those legitimate grounds, public order, public health, and morality or public morals as we call it. So these are the legitimate grounds. It's only if laws are grounded in one of those purposes, one or more of those purposes, that they may legitimately limit or restrain speech. And also, any limitations on speech, as you can see from the text of Article 19, they must be necessary and proportionate. This means that any limitation on speech must be the, the must be a measure of last resort, basically. If there are other ways in which one can achieve one of those public policy aims, one of those legitimate aims uh, uh, without restricting speech, then a limitation on speech will not be necessary, right? So necessity means that, that it's only if it's absolutely necessary, it's only if there's no other less restrictive way to achieve that particular policy goal that a limitation on speech is warranted. Proportionality, on the other hand, means that any limitation on speech that is necessary must not go beyond what is necessary to achieve that particular aim. So basically one needs to balance here the, the, the aim that one is trying to achieve, whether this is national security, whether this is the rights or reputation of others, public order, public health, or morals. One must balance the importance of that legitimate ground with the limitation of speech. And so limitation of speech should not be more excessive than the importance of the of the public policy game than, than one is trying to that one is trying to protect. So this is basically the framework for limiting freedom of expression and information under Article 19 of the ICPR. So in a nutshell, any limitation on expression and information must be grounded in law, it must be legitimate, and it must be necessary and proportionate to achieve a legitimate aim. Right. So this is Article 19. Um, which is one of the key provisions when it comes to online hate speech. The second key provision uh, that applies to the issue of online and offline hate is Article 20 of the ICCPR. And Article 20 is an interesting provision. It's a more specific provision that requires states to uh, prohibit by law. So it's a, it, it provides for a very specific way to tackle uh, especially egregious forms of speech. And that form is a prohibition by law. So it specifically requires states, parties to the uh, ICCPR to prohibit by law, though not necessarily criminal laws. On the one hand, propaganda for war, propaganda for unlawful wars, right? Such as the, the war that Russia is waging on Ukraine, uh, for example. And on the other hand, Article uh, 20, also requires states to prohibit by law any advocacy of national, religious, or, or racial hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. So this is a very high threshold. So these are very serious types of, 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 of speech, a very egregious forms of speech. And this provision was drafted right after the Second World, World War. So it was a, a, an important reaction to the way in which speech was used to drive atrocities in Europe during that time. But at the same time, even though this provision is very important, it symbolizes you know, agreement that um, individuals must be protected from these kinds of particularly egregious forms of speech. It's, it's also very controversial because it forces states to prohibit those types of speech. And in many countries, there is a reluctance to prohibit speech, including in the United Kingdom, but also in particular in the United States, where they have in the US Constitution, the First Amendment that protects speech in a very, very strong way. And so many countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, the Netherlands have reserved when, when ratifying, when agreeing to the ICPR, they have nonetheless reserved the right not to adopt this type of prohibitive legislation, right? So they have said, okay, we agree 
that individuals must be protected from these kinds of speech. These kinds of speech are very serious, they're bad, but we do not agree that, you know, to in order to, um, to limit or to protect individuals from these kinds of speech, we should, we must uh, prohibit them, right? So this is the, this is the state of, of, of the law when it comes to the ICPR and hate speech. Now, um, moving on to my second argument, right, about content moderation. So as I said before, uh, the second claim that I make in my paper, which follows on from the previous one, which is about the ICPR being important in this space, is that content moderation is essential. It's essential to give effect to those two provisions of the ICPR, right? Um, and, and just to be clear, when I talk about content moderation, th th there's a tendency in the media, especially in mainstream media, to associate content moderation with content takedowns or content deletion. The two are not synonymous, right? So content moderation doesn't necessarily equate to content takedowns, actually. Content moderation is actually a lot broader. It basically means content governance or content management. Any measure that an online platform adopts to review or to manage or to curate or otherwise affect the publication or dissemination of an individual piece of content, whether to limit that particular piece of content or to advance it. So actually, in a nutshell, content moderation means a range of includes a range of, of, of tools uh, with which companies can, can uh, manage or review the publication of online content, right? So it includes content takedowns or content deletion, but it also includes other less extreme, less serious measures, such as, for example, uh, labeling. So during the pandemic, we saw a lot of posts on social media that were labeled, that contained a label, please, um, this information has not been checked, or, or a label redirecting users to official health sources, official health institutions, such as the World Health Organization. Uh, we can also have measures uh, of content moderation uh, along the lines of uh, demoting content. So rather than promoting content, we can, we can tweak recommendation algorithms to actually demote or deprioritize certain types of content, right? So there are a number of ways in which platforms, in which companies can moderate content that are not necessarily as serious as content takedowns or deplatforming or suspending, excluding a certain user from, from, from the platform. Um, so going back to my argument, I argue that content moderation by companies and content regulation by states are essential measures to operationalize Articles 19 and 20 of the ICPR, even if other uh, measures that are not based on content, such as uh, transparency mechanisms, media literacy campaigns, uh, are, are also important to tackle the, the, the problem of online hate speech. There are two reasons why I argue that content moderation is essential to give effect to the ICPR. The first reason is because on the one hand, as we saw from the text of articles uh, 19 and 20 of the ICPR, any interference with individuals' rights to freedom of expression and information depends on the content at hand. That is, it depends on whether the content that we're talking about is one that, for example, incites to violence, discrimination, or hostility in accordance with Article 20, or it is a certain piece of content that affects uh, the rights or reputations of others like defamation or national security, public order, public health or morals and so on and so forth, right? So the first reason that content moderation is essential is that we need for any limitation on speech, we need to look at the content at hand, right? This is not exactly the same thing as viewpoint discrimination which is unlawful, for example, under the US Constitution, and many free speech advocates are, uh, are opposed to, right? They're opposed to viewpoint discrimination. And actually, um, it is because of, um, it is because of uh, an alleged uh, discrimination, an alleged tendency to discriminate 
uh, platform uses on the base of viewpoint uh, that uh, many uh, conservative states in the United in the United States, for example, have adopted social media laws trying to impose on social media platforms um, uh, limitations on their moderation, basically requiring to be requiring them to be uh, viewpoint neutral in their content moderation policies. So a lot of people are critical of viewpoint discrimination, right? But what I'm arguing here, which is basically that we need to be looking at certain aspects of the content when, uh, when implementing the ICPR is not the same thing as viewpoint discrimination. What, 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 what I'm talking about is basically we are looking at certain aspects or certain particular elements or features of the content that are relevant, right? Uh, we're not looking at the political orientation of, of, the, of the speech, whether it's conservative or liberal or left or right or whatever. This is not what, um, the, what my framework proposes, what, what my argument is about. It is about looking at certain aspects of the content that have a bearing on the legitimate grounds to limit speech. So this is the first reason why I think content moderation is essential to give effect to the ICPR when it comes to online hate speech and other types of problematic content. The second reason why I think that content moderation is key here is because different types of content call for different measures of limitation, right? So remember uh, when um, we talked about uh, Article 19.3 of the ICPR, any limitation on speech needs to be necessary and proportionate. Right, so that's, that's the necessity and proportionality test. And so this basically means that any limitation on speech needs to be well calibrated to the seriousness of the speech in question, as well as to the importance of the legitimate aim that one is trying to uphold. And so basically, this is exactly what content moderation uh, is supposed to do. It's meant, as the name suggests, it's to moderate content. It, it's meant to calibrate speech limitations to the seriousness of the speech in question, right? So if done properly, content moderation can help us implement the necessity and proportionality test that Article 19.3 of the ICPR requires for any limitation on speech. So this is the, the second argument that I make in the paper. Finally, let me turn to my final argument in the paper, which is my proposed classification or taxonomy of online hate speech. Um, so this is the main contribution of the paper because no one has, uh, has actually uh, framed hate speech or online hate speech in such a, in such a way. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an innovative way to, to, to frame the problem of hate speech. So what I argue in the paper in a nutshell is that this classification that I propose, which is applicable to both online and offline hate speech, can be drawn from the text and the spirit of articles 19 and 20 of the ICPR. So basically what I'm arguing is that one can read this classification in between the lines of those two provisions that we saw earlier, but what my work has tried to do is to give it clear shape and practical effect, to give clear shape and, pr and practical effect to those provisions through this classification, basically. And so basically, based on the different types of content and the different uh, legal consequences that each type of speech attracts under Articles 19 and 20. And remember, as I've mentioned earlier, um, speech uh, is, is regulated under Articles 19 and 20 on the basis of certain aspects of the content and the legal consequences that uh, different kinds of uh, content warrant in different circumstances, right? So on the basis of these two criteria, the content, relevant aspects of the content, and uh, and legal consequences uh, that each type of content attracts, um, I argue that there are three key categories or types of, of, of hate speech or of speech within which hate speech can fit. Now, just to be clear, hate speech is not a legal term. It's not a legal concept, right? It is not defined in the ICPR or in any other legal instrument in international law. It's not a technical legal term in international law. Different states and their domestic laws, they might well define hate speech. Uh, I am not familiar with different uh, domestic laws uh, on this issue, but under international law, 
there is no legal definition for hate speech. Hate speech online and offline is actually a factual phenomenon and a multifaceted one. It encompasses a wide range of, of speech acts that are characterized basically by the use of rhetoric to dehumanize, to denigrate, to degrade individuals or groups on the basis of a protected characteristic, such as race, nationality, ethnicity, religion, or gender, for example. So this is what hate speech is. It's not a legal term, right? It is a fact. And uh, this diversity of, of, of hatred, uh, the, the, the diversity or the different ways in which hate speech can be defined is actually often problematic because sometimes it, it forces companies to err on the side of censorship in an attempt to eliminate as much hatred as possible on their platforms, right? So given this diversity, uh, uh, this wide range of, 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 of hate speech, what my taxonomy has tried to do is precisely to try and organize it, to make sense of the factual mess of, of online hate uh, on the basis of those two legally relevant features of speech under the ICPL, which are content and legal content. Right. So the first category that I propose in my paper, as you can see on your screen, is what I call prohibited speech. This category is covered by Article 20 of the ICPR, which is which we saw earlier, which includes war propaganda and incitement to violence, hostility and discrimination. These are very serious types of hate speech, as we saw earlier. Right. So they're on the one hand, they're intentional because both propaganda and incitement imply intentional behavior and intend to, to, to advocate for something and intend to convince individuals of, of something, of a certain behavior, of a certain ideal, right? And on the other hand, these acts, uh, um, war propaganda and incitement, they're also very proximate to actual acts of violence or physical harm, right? When, when we're talking about propaganda, uh, we're talking about very serious kinds of advocacy that come really close to the actual thing that one is advocating for. The same goes for incitement. Incitement has to be uh, interpreted as sufficiently proximate to actual acts of violence, discrimination, or hostility, right? Um, and, and so because these are very serious types of hate speech, they require the most serious and proactive measures. So we saw earlier the Article 20 of the ICPR requires states to prohibit by law uh, these kinds of hate speech. How does that translate to uh, content moderation policies by online platforms? I argue in the paper that because of the seriousness of these types of speech, uh, companies, online platforms, and states need to be asking platforms to be removing these kinds of content, taking these kinds of content down as far as possible, right? At the very least, when it's manifestly clear that a certain piece of content indeed amounts to war propaganda or incitement to violence, hostility, or discrimination, right? Um, and actually, if you look at the Digital Services Act and if you look at the online safety bill, that's exactly what they require companies to do, to try their best to remove these types of prohibited or illegal content. So one example, of such a such type of, of, of content prohibited uh, online hate speech are uh, some tweets that appeared uh, at the beginning and, and Facebook posts that appeared at the beginning of the war in Ukraine that were instigating individuals to kill Vladimir Putin following the invasion of Ukraine. So even though uh, um, Ukrainian soldiers combatants are lawfully um, can lawfully kill Vladimir Putin as the head of state of Russia, right? Under the laws of war, soldiers can kill uh, the, the commander in chief of a state. But the fact of the matter is that ordinary individuals cannot do that. So this, these kinds of posts are prohibited under international law uh, and under the ICPR in particular. The second category of speech that I propose in my paper is what I refer to as limited online hate speech. And this corresponds to the types of online and offline hate that may but need not be limited under Article 19.3 of the ICPR. So remember from the text of Article 19.3 of the ICPR that limitations on these types of hate speech 
must be grounded in clear and accessible laws, and they must be put in place for a legitimate reason, including public health, morals, national security, the rights of others, and so on and so forth. And this must be done, any limitation on these kinds of speech must be done in a necessary and proportionate way. Now, necessity and proportionality require states and online platforms, as I've mentioned earlier, to carefully calibrate the measure of limitation, the limiting measure to the seriousness of the speech act. And I argue in my paper that making this kind of necessity and proportionality assessment for limited types of speech requires platforms and states to consider a number of particular factors that are not explicitly listed in the ICPR. For example, the social historical context, the prominence of the speaker, the likelihood of the audience acting upon the speech, the vulnerability of victims uh, uh, to that particular speech, and the way in which hatred is conveyed. So for example, Donald Trump is a very a prominent speaker. A lot of people follow him. A lot of people would likely act upon his tweets, as we saw with the Capitol riots. And in the United States at the time of the Capitol riots, there was a lot of division uh, following uh, the, uh, the election, right, the 2020 election. And so in those circumstances, that particular tweet by Donald Trump would uh, deserve some form of limitation at the very least, not just that particular one, but other uh, less inflammatory tweets would probably, uh, would probably deserve some sort of limitation, right? Um, another example uh, of, of this kind of, of speech uh, are, is Holocaust denial which in many states is prohibited, even criminalized, like Germany and France. But in other states, like in the United States, is something that is not uh, prohibited, but well, it may be limited in some circumstances, right? Um, so um, basically what I argue in my paper is that because the, the this category of speech, uh, this category of online hate speech is, um, requires a careful assessment of necessity and proportionality, platforms can't just take down these types of content, right? They need to look at a range, they need to use a range of measures short of content takedowns to moderate these types of speech. That are measures that are proportionate to the seriousness of the content at hand and the value that they're trying, the legitimate aim that they're trying to uphold. So for example, as I've already mentioned, there's labeling, there's deprioritization or uh, content demotion. Um, uh, platforms can also uh, ask users to help them uh, in making uh, content moderation choices and so on and so forth. So there are a range of measures that platforms can use short of content takedowns to moderate these types of speech. Finally, uh, the third and final uh, category of hate speech, uh, of online hate speech that I propose in my paper is what I call protected hate speech. And this is a residual category of speech that covers all types of hate speech that are neither prohibited nor are maybe limited in the circumstances, right? So just to be clear, under the ICCPR, there are no types of speech that are always necessarily protected. Like for example, political speech in America. Virtually, under the ICBR, virtually any speech may be sub subject to limitation under Article 19.3, provided that the requirements are met. And remember, these requirements are um, limitation by law for a legitimate purpose and in a necessary and proportionate way, right? Uh, and this assessment will always be contextual. It will always depend on the context at hand, right? Whether or not a certain type of speech deserves to be limited or not, because language is contextual. Right, so this will always depend on context, but usually, usually the kinds of speech that are that don't deserve any type of limitation, and therefore must be protected by states and platforms, are speech uh, offensive speech that are that is not directed at individuals or groups, but is directed at institutions. For example, governments or religions or religious leaders, and so on and so forth. And this is because institutions per se are not protected under international human rights law. And so this is what I call institutional hate speech. So one example of this kind of speech are those satirical cartoons that make fun of religious leaders, for example, like the Prophet Muhammad. Now, um, states and platforms cannot limit these types of speech that don't warrant any limitation. But that doesn't mean that 
states or platforms cannot um, adopt what I call preventive measures that do not themselves limit speech, uh, but actually um, tackle the root causes of these kinds of speech, as well as other types of hate speech, right? So measures that are short of limitation, but which can be adopted to tackle um, these kinds or to address the, the harmful consequences of these kinds of, of, of speech, for example, division in society, right? Because these, these kinds of speech, even though they're protected, they may, they may cause more division in society. They may lead to violence and so on and so forth. So there are some measures that don't directly limit speech, but which can be helpful to tackle these kinds of speech that states and platforms can adopt. And these measures include educational initiatives, such as digital and media literacy campaigns, promotion of positive forms of engagement online. So for example, platforms can tweak their algorithms to promote positive types of, of, of speech um, that are not offensive. Uh, they can adopt measures of transparency. For example, they can be more transparency about their content moderation policies. Uh, their content moderation decisions. Uh, we can, states can also adopt laws against media concentration. So all of these measures don't in and of themselves uh, affect or limit uh, speech, but they are helpful to tackle the root causes of all kinds of hate speech, right? Uh, and one just final caveat about this classification that I propose is that it is context specific, as I have already uh, mentioned earlier. And this is because, you know, a certain uh, speech, a certain piece of content that may be innocuous in one place might not be so in another. And the flip side is also true. So a certain piece of, of content might be very serious in one place, but not be so serious in another. Right. And this is because at the end of the day, as I have already said earlier, language is contextual. So any assessment of whether or not a certain piece of content falls under each of those categories is contextual. It depends on the particular context at hand. Uh, so to conclude, uh, the ICPR is not a panacea or a silver bullet to resolve all the problems uh, caused by online hate speech and uh, the online and offline environments. Right. It's only one piece of the puzzle, and it's a very complicated puzzle. There are so many pieces to it, right? So it's a jigsaw, rather. But what I argue in my paper is that the ICPR is nonetheless a very valuable piece of this puzzle because it is already there. It's, a, it's an existing legal instrument, and it can be interpreted and, and applied in a very practical and granular way, as I have demonstrated allowing states, online platforms, and other stakeholders to tackle the problem of online hate speech using a common universal language or a common universal framework, right? It is true that the ICPR is very contextual as any uh, legal framework to address this, this kind of problem, right? Uh, again, language is contextual. But the main takeaway that I, that I, that I have from this, from this research is that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to, to moderating online hate speech in developed and developing countries. But what I argue in the paper is that far from being a weakness, this is actually the main strength of the ICPR because it has enormous potential to bridge uh, some of the deep long-standing divides that we have seen across countries, across regions, and even within the same country uh, when it comes to, to hate speech, right? Uh, so I'll end it there and uh, happy to take questions. And I hope, I hope my voice wasn't too terrible and you could follow the presentation. Thank you so much, Lita. I know, I'd, congratulations again. I know how much you're suffering. I, I did. I, thank you so much. I know your voice very much kept up. Thank you so much. Um, I see Tom has a hand raised already. So Tom, do you want to fire over your question? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Talita. That's, that's a fascinating paper, I'm sure for many uh, people in a, an extremely uh, contentious area, very much in the news. Um, especially as we uh, follow the, um, you know, what will happen with Elon Musk's purchase of, of Twitter, exactly. of course. Um, my question, however, is um, it relates to the UK and the online safety bill, as I think it still is. Um, I'm assuming that obviously the government lawyers have checked that as drafted, it is uh, compliant with uh, the, your international covenant on uh, political and civil rights, um, which would be nice considering the, um, the, 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 the statement that they've 
compose various other laws is that they're no longer compliant with other international obligations. So that's, uh, but it, it, you know, it's a question, how, I, I, I imagine you have uh, reviewed it, looked at it, and so we're, you know, intrigued to know, you know, how you feel, you know, is it an appropriate um, uh, statute uh, to insert into this space? Um, you know, how, what, what might be new in it in an international context that might provide uh, precedent for other uh, important jurisdictions in this. So um, that that's my question. You know, how, how 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 do you see that? Thank you so much, Thomas, for that question. Uh, it's a great question, and I actually I I was invited to give testimony uh, before one of the parliamentary committees uh, charged with uh, scrutinizing the bill, uh, and uh, my testimony was exactly about the. Uh, online safety bills compliance with the ICCPR. Mm. Uh, and this was before they actually amended the bill. Uh, and so I can I can talk a little bit about what the bill was before and, and, and how it became after uh, the amendment and after my testimony. So um, there are uh, aspects of the bill. There are elements of the bill that are compliant with the ICPR and others that are not so much so. Uh, and actually, some of my some of my proposals, uh, uh, some of the, the the suggestions that I made when I was testifying before the committee uh, on how to ensure compliance with the ICPR, actually made their way into the revised bill, right? So some of these these proposals, but not all of them. So what is good about the bill, right? How is it compliant with the ICPR? So the first the first uh, key aspect of the bill that I think is really welcome is that the it's grounded or, or it's, its main thrust is a duty of care, right? It's, it's based on this idea of a duty of care of platforms to, uh, to, to mitigate the consequences of different types of, of, of content, illegal and harmful, even though legal, right? So these are the two categories of speech that fall under the online safety bill. So duties of care, I argue, I, I, I argued uh, before the, the, the committee was a good idea because um, unlike uh, legal regimes that are based in what, what is referred to as intermediate, li intermediate liability, basically intermediate liability is when you impose liability on platforms for third party content, right? So that exists, for example, in Germany. So platforms can be liable in Germany for content that is posted by users. This is intermediary liability. The online safety bill doesn't do that. It follows uh, a different approach, and this is precisely uh, the, the duty of care approach, right? Uh, and the duty of care is uh, consistent with the IACPR because under the ICPR, as I mentioned earlier, companies don't have obligations, uh, right, to... to, to to comply with the ICCPR. States actually have obligations, legal obligations to apply the ICCPR. And actually one of the key obligations that states have under the ICCPR is um, to protect freedom of expression and freedom of information. And uh, freedom of expression and the protection of freedom of expression and freedom of information requires states to ensure a plural, uh, independent, diverse media environment. And that includes, that involves requiring companies to exercise their, to, their best efforts, to, access, to, to, to basically do their best, to impose on companies a duty of care, right? A duty, a, a, an obligation of conduct, of best efforts, rather than a duty to take down particular types of content, right? Or to achieve a particular result. So basically the ICPR requires states to ensure that companies exercise that duty. So this is why the, the online safety bill is in line with the ICPR when it comes to the general approach of imposing on platforms obligations of conduct or care or due care rather than obligations to take down, remove particular pieces of content. Why is this, is this approach uh, better than the other one, intermediary liability? Because if you ask companies to take down content, they're just going to take down everything, right? They're just going to over -sensor. Right. They're going to err on the side of taking down because, you know, if there's something up that is going to lead to liability, then they're going to have to pay for that, right? 
So this is why the duty of care model is a good one and is in line with the ICPR. The definition of uh, illegal content. So illegal content is one of the two categories of, of speech that are covered by the online safety care. The definition of illegal content before the amendments was a bit vague. So this, this was actually one of my points during my testimony. It didn't really clarify what, what, laws, uh, um, what laws were covered by uh, uh, basically like the illegality at hand, right? So what kinds of rules, what rules a certain content would have to contravene for it to be illegal, right? So this was unclear. And then I said, well, this was one of my points. I said, oh, you need to clarify that because you know, under the ICPR, remember, for any limitation on speech, uh, laws need to be clear, they need to be accessible and foreseeable. And this is not accessible, right? And so after, uh, the, after the amendments, after scrutiny um, in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons, um, I think the, the House of Commons introduced uh, an amendment basically clarifying that only, only criminal criminal uh, speech acts amounted to illegal, illegal content, which is a welcome development because it's only and it's only when speech acts are serious enough that they, 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 they have that they can be prohibited right under the ICPR that necessity and proportionality test. The the aspect of the online safety bill that is not compliant with the ICPR is the definition of legal but harmful content. I've made this point when I testified there. I said, well, the, the, the way in which you are defining harmful content is very wide, right? You're basically saying that any type of content that causes physical or psychological harm to any individual of uh, average characteristics, that is, that is a definition of harmful content. This is far too wide. So if I am upset by a certain piece of content, then that's going to be harmful, and then platforms have a duty, a safety, a duty of care towards that particular type of content. I think that this is this is a bit too vague, and this is not compliant with the strict requirements of legality, legitimacy, um, necessity, and proportionality of the ICPR. Right. The other aspect of the online safety bill that I just that I don't think is compliant with the ICPR uh, is the fact that the penalties the penalties that are imposed uh, by, uh, or that can be imposed by Ofcon, the regulator, for breaches of those duties of care, the penalties are very high, right? So if Ofcom finds that uh, platforms are in breach of the online safety bill of their duties, then uh, the, 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 the fines are very, very high. It's like 10% of their annual revenue, I think, as it stands right now. And this is going to uh, inevitably lead to platforms being a lot more, um, a lot more protected when it comes to speech. Meaning they're going to try and over censor content because these penalties are just so heavy. I think that there are better ways to achieve better ways to induce compliance with safety duties than imposing those very heavy fines. So those are my my views on the online safety bill. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Salita. Uh, is there anyone, I'm, I'm just aware of time and also Salita's voice, but does anyone uh, have any, one last question maybe? Just, uh, if anyone does have anything, if they want to type it in the box, I will just uh, quickly go through what's coming up next. Uh, so next uh, Jesus International will be on the 1st of December. And we've got uh, Dr. Bry Wilson talking about marine biology and brain coral off the Chagos Islands. So um, in the darkness of December, we'll all be taken away to wonderful sunshine and, and seas. So do, do join us for that. Uh, and booking of that will open probably in the next week or so. Uh, what we do have booking for are two events in college. Uh, we have um, the next uh, production as part of the Jesus Shakespeare Project, Henry VI, part one. 
which I've started working with wonderful students who are going to be performing that. In fact, as a slight link to tonight's talk, uh, part two of Henry VI has a lot to do with hate speech, the way it controls the crowd, so much so that a, a line from Henry VI part two was taken down by Twitter erroneously in April. Uh, the first thing we'll do, let's kill all the lawyers, was misinterpreted by Twitter as a legitimate <laughs> threat. So um, you can uh, experience a play with tremendous contemporary relevance there. Or if you want something lighter, on the 3rd of December, we have a celebration of the wonderful works of Gilbert and Sullivan, a special lunch, and it works very close to my own heart. So if you want, there is some non-compulsory join-in singing as part of it as well. So if you'd like to have a festive sing-along with us, uh, you can sign up for both of those events now on our website. Um, but in the meantime, do we have any last questions or... Uh, I see Antonio's put his camera oh, on, but I'm not yeah. sure, uh, or any comments. Oh, I, just a, a lovely comment from Jake in the chat box. Very thanks to Peter. Fascinating and important work, beautifully explained. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, my voice was not beautiful, but <laughs> thank you. you. Well, I, I think maybe we'll, we will let you, thank you once again, and I'll let you rest your voice after what has, I know, been a very busy conference season with your book launch recently as well. So to re rest your voice. And thank you again so much for what has been an absolutely fascinating and timely talk. Thank so you. Th thank you all so much. And thank you for joining us, uh, all audience. And I hope to see you at another event soon. Thank you and give a good night. Bye. Good night.